heard you. I, I'm, sh I'm sure you're getting used to that by now. How you doing, big boy? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing good. You know, last time we, you know, we, we talked about a lot of things with Kobe Bryant, but the last thing we've talked about was 81 points you dropped on the Toronto Raptors. I mean, wh what were you thinking about? What, what was going on? Tell me. Well, you know, we just wanted to win the game. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in that type of situation, we were down by 18, 20 points. And uh, we needed some energy. And as a leader of the ball club, you know, I have to provide that spark. Mm -hmm. And when we're lacking something, and, and that's what I tried to do, and then it just turned into something special. Now, that, that sounds good, and I'm not denying that. I know that's true. The difference is, is that I watched that game, Kobe, and with about three minutes left, you knew y'all were going to win the game. I mean, you overcame like a 14-point deficit, came back, and just, I mean, you basically demoralized them, which is what you like to do. <laughs> when did you know, when did you know that you were going for 80? Uh, well, when I had about 77 points. In the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the crowd just got into it, and my teammates just got into it, and uh, they wanted to see me go for it, and that's uh, yeah, so what I tried to do. You know, when you talk about the 81 points, I mean, obviously, that's second to Will Chamberlain. Um, I think about, I put that performance second. Let me just reveal what I feel. Not Wilt's 100 points, Michael Jordan's 63 against Boston in a playoff game. I put right up there. Do you think it should rank number one all time, number two all time, number three all time? What do you think? Of it? Do you think about it's, that at no, all? I, I, I don't think about it much. I mean, I, I, I just go out there and just try to play the game. You know, as a fan, it's, it's much easier for me to judge, you know, what Michael did and uh, what Larry's done and what Magic have done in the playoffs just as a fan. Because, you know, I watch those games. Mm -hmm. it's, it's much harder for me to judge my own Yeah, performance. but I'm not talking about while you were playing. I'm talking about after you know you've done it and y'all already win the game and you go back home and you think and reflect on what you've accomplished. Right. No, I think it was, a, you know, it was, I think it was entertaining for people to watch. But, you know, you look at what Michael's done in the playoffs. You look at what Magic and Larry and those guys have done in the playoffs. And you know, putting those type of performances up. You know, in the playoffs is, a, is another thing, and hopefully we can, you know, get there and uh, you know have a good showing in the playoffs ourselves. Right now, not to sour your mood at all, but I'm, as a matter of fact, I don't think this will sour your mood. I mean, Vince Carter had something to say. Vince Carter, of all people, had something to say about your 81 points performance. Let me read this quote to you. The only bad thing about it is that younger kids whose minds are easily warped are going to think, oh, I'm going to go out there and do it instead of the team concept first. Vince Carter said this about your 81-point performance. When you hear a comment like that, especially coming from a guy who's known for, you know, dropping 50 and dunking on people, but not exactly the most fundamentally sound ball player in the world, what thoughts come to your mind? Well, I just really let it go in one ear and go out the other. Mm -hmm. You know, I think if, um, you know, people who are watching the game, you know, knew what that game was about. Mm -hmm. They knew what I had to do to kind of get us back in the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of the day, it's about winning the game. Mm -hmm. And we won. Mm. There's nothing else to be said. Now, now, here's the part that some people might not know about you, but I think I know. See how I ask you the question, your eyes get narrow. And what that says to me is, I remember Vince said that when I see him next time. <laughs> that's, what that said. that's what that says to me. Am I lying? You know, uh, I just try to use everything I can for motivation. And that's mm. a tool, you know, for, for me to be able to elevate my team to play the best basketball. So. Uh, I try to use a bit of everything. Mm -hmm. Now, Dow had it out before I me mean, last time he was at the Staples Center. Y'all got into a little shoving match there. What was that about, by the way? Um, I'm not really sure. I, I think it was just a, it was a physical game. Mm -hmm. And uh, he tried to go to the basket and uh, try to strip the ball. Mm -hmm. I wound up being a foul, pretty hard foul. And, you know, he had some, you know, hard feelings about it. And we had some work. <laughs> Well, you know, I think about it, I'm saying to myself, you know, a lot of people's going to come after you hard. Do you find that to be the case now? You're the leader of the Los Angeles Lakers. I mean, obviously, you look at this situation right now, everybody talks about Lamar Odom, but basically, it's a relatively young team. You're the leader. Do you find that cats are coming after you harder and stronger than ever before? Uh, I knew that going into this season, and Lamar and I talked about that prior to, to the start of the season, you know, what our opposition was, what they were going to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things I said is our mentality has to be we're going to hunt you. Mm. And that's how I approach the game every single night. I'm not going to sit back and wait for you, you, know, you to come out and make the first hit or take the first blow or put us on our heels. Mm. You know, we're going we're gonna to strike first. You know, and I'm thinking about the Lakers. Does, are you the only person on your team that has that kind of attitude? You know, I don't think so. Uh, I really don't. Who I mean, we else? Have some, you know, Believe it or not, I mean, we, we really do have some players right. that are willing to step up and, and play hard. Yeah, but it's a difference between playing hard and being an assassin. 
Oh, we Alan Iverson, I spoke to him the other day. He called you a flat-out assassin. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> That's, what <he> <laughs> That's what he said. That's what he said. But seriously, you look at this team right now, how far do you think you guys can go? With the team as presently constructed, you leading the way. How far can it's you a, go? You know, it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough thing to judge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the system that we're playing is really predicated on, on us being on the same page mm -hmm. and having that chemistry. Mm -hmm. And it's taken a while for us to pick up the nuances of the, of the game, of the mm -hmm. triangle and how Phil teaches it. But once we pick it up, I mean, you'll see a drastic improvement. It'll happen pretty quickly. Why does it seem to be taking so long, though? Well, you know, in this type of offense, everybody has to be on the same page at all times. It's not, it's not a set play. I'm not going to, you know, Phil doesn't sit there and say, okay, we're going to, um, you know, run a zipper action. We're going to get Stephen A. the ball. We're going to run a screen roll. You know, this is your play. We're going to ISO you on the post. We, you know, we don't do that. Okay. Everything's predicated off of reads. And uh, at, collectively, as a whole, we have to be able to read the defense. And then each and every player out there has to make the adjustments by being on the same page. It's, it's pretty cool to think about, but... It's difficult to get. Yeah. We get into the Lakers and everything. Let's just rewind the clock back a little bit and go back to the very, very beginning. You know, a lot of people don't realize this. You're six years old. You in Italy. Raised, I mean, basically growing up in Italy. Can you please tell us what that was like? Because I'm, how many languages do you speak, first of all? Uh, speak two fluently. Working on three, which is Spanish. So working on Spanish? Working on Why are you working on Spanish? My wife speaks Spanish. Yeah, no, that's small. That's small. I like that. But talk about, I'm sorry, I digressed. I apologize. But talk to me about how, how it was growing up in Italy for you. Uh, well, at the time, it was all I knew. I mean, mm -hmm. growing up, moved over there when I was six years old. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in hindsight, it was great because it, you know, it gave me experience, um, you know, to see how another culture is living, to, to kind of mature uh, as far as... Um, you know, have a broader understanding of what the world looks like. And so, I mean, it helped me out a lot. And when it came to basketball, my grandparents used to send me out all the tapes mm -hmm. of all the games. Mm -hmm. So it was the Lakers, the, the Celtics, the Bulls. She used to, her and my grandfather used to put a packet of tapes together. They used to send them out to us. And I used to sit there at the house and just, just watch the games over and over and over again. How did that shape your personality and your estimation? Because some people, a lot of people, like when they talk about Kobe Bryant, they say, had he grown up into, in the States, he might have had a different, more even more outgoing personality. How did that shape your personality growing up? Well, around? yeah, I'm a very outgoing guy. I'm just not an outgoing guy with, you know, people that I really don't know. Right. So you, you, know you, consider I mean? yourself a, you consider yourself an outgoing guy? Well, people who know me, yeah. Mm -hmm. What would they say about you? What? People that know you, yeah. that say you're an outgoing guy, what, what would they say? What, what, would they, what would they say about you? I'm a pretty sarcastic dude. Mm. <laughs> heard, heard I'm people a funny think, guy, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, coming in, you know, I, I think about this too. You got, you're in high school. You're playing at Lower Marion, averaging like 30 points, 12 rebounds, three steals. You just did everything. Won a, you know, quadruple A state championship. I know all of that stuff, Lower Marion in Pennsylvania. But you decide to go pro. Why? Because you were going to go to Duke if you elected to go to college. Mm -hmm. Why did you make the decision to go pro? Well, I had a chance to play against some of the best basketball players in the world. And the decision, the reason why I made the decision is to be able to compete against them mm -hmm. every single night and to learn at a higher level than, you know, anything that I could possibly learn at the college level. You're playing against the best. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know what, whether I'm ready or not, I don't know. But I know once I get there, I'll be able to learn from the best. And I know that I'm going to work hard, so one day I will be ready if I'm not ready when I first make the jump. But when did you make the decision that you were going, whether ready or not, NBA, here I come? When did you make that, when did you make that call? Well, I mean, you have, to make, you, know, you have to make your estimations as far as where you're going to go in the draft. Mm -hmm. you know, so I didn't just blindly just jump into a decision, not knowing where I was going to end up potentially. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once I you know, was comfortable with you know, where I could potentially go, and I just went for it. Now, it's interesting that you bring that up because the Charlotte Hornets, not the Los Angeles Lakers, drafted you with a 13th overall pick. So, I mean, were you anticipating, did you know you were going to Los Angeles? Were you anticipating you were going to be in Charlotte? What was the situation? Actually, after I got drafted, um, you, know, you have to go in, you have to do your calls. Mm -hmm. you know, so I go in and I do a call and I speak to a representative uh, from the organization at the time. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, they told me that you know, they were looking to move me because they really didn't have any use or need for me. Mm -hmm. 
I said, they didn't have any use for you, even though they traded you for Vlade Diva. Well, you know, I was, at the time, I mean, I was, you know, 17 years old. And, and I heard that, and I was like, okay. Mm. I know what I'm going to be doing every day this summer. Mm -hmm. All day that? this summer. Train my butt off. Mm. You know, because when I hear stuff like that, I mean, that's just automatically just telling me you can't do something. You can't, you know, we don't need you. Mm -hmm. Okay. But where did you get, uh, again, we go back to your personality, because where do you get that from? Like, I, like didn't I just tell y'all about how his eyes narrow and everything? He's like, oh, okay, okay, I'm going to remember y'all. Where does that come from? Because the perception is growing up in Italy, you know, we don't view Italy the way we view Harlem, New York, or, you know, south side of Chicago, or anything like that. You look at it as a relatively affluent and comfortable environment, so you know what, you, that fire in your eyes, that fire in your belly, it's usually not perceived as being there. Where do you get that from then? I don't know where it comes from. It's just always been there. Uh, but growing up in Italy, you know, what I used to hear a lot, which just absolutely drove me crazy, was all the kids would say, you know what? You're a good basketball player here, but once you go back to the States, you're not going to be able to do none of this stuff. They used to tell you that? They used to tell me, oh, you're, no, they're too good over there. Mm -hmm. they're, they're taller, they're more athletic, they're faster, they play the game much better, and they, you know, you're not going to be able to do any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And that just absolutely drove me crazy. Mm. So then you come back to the States, and your mission is to prove some things, and ultimately you end up just killing everybody on the high school level. You go to the pros, Utah, Western Conference semifinals. Airborne. Not too many people remember that. Oh, I do. <laughs> I'm you know, sure I you do. do. I, I know do. You, you know, <laughs> that's right, that's right. You I know, he's going to bring it up, oh, too, listen, man. Oh, listen, let me tell you something God. right now. Hold on, hold on. Before you get, trust me, I'm on your side here. You shot an air ball in regulation. You shot two air balls in overtime. And guess why? Everybody else was sitting there crucifying you. This is what I was thinking. Dell Harris started this man just six games that season. Why is this rookie in that position? Especially when there was friction because you wanted more playing time and you felt you deserved more playing time. So I'm like, why were you in that position to begin with? What were the thoughts that were going through your mind when those air balls came raining down on the Delta Center? Okay. I took the first one. Mm -hmm. It felt good. It did. It felt good. It felt good. And it went short. I just said, damn, I'm going to make the next one. And the next one, damn, I'm going to make the next one because these feel good. Right. Then I shoot the next one. I said, damn, okay, I'm due. Mm. <laughs> All right. And then I shot two more. Well, well, well uh, sorry to digress for a second, but how does an air ball feel good? I just want to know. No, because you know what? I, I want to know that no, but no, no, that's a really good question. <laughs> right, but right. you know, like sometimes you shoot the ball and you release it, and the trajectory feels good. Your follow through is good. Mm -hmm. It's right there on target. It's in line. You're keeping the follow through up in the air, and then it goes short. Mm -hmm. But it feels good. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's kind of like a shock to miss those sometimes. Now. After that experience, obviously that weighs very heavily on your mind, but ultimately Kobe Bryant works on this game. Sha Shaquille O'Neal is right there in the house with you to begin with. Your game is elevated to another level. What did you do to get your game to that level specifically? For those out there, I mean, we got a whole bunch of basketball kids in the house. Yeah. No, what did you well, do to get your game to that level? The prime example is uh, I've, had, I've had a trainer, the same trainer has been training me for the last 10 years, named mm -hmm. Joe Carbone. And after I shot those air balls, you know, I sat there and I, I thought, you know, as soon as we got down the plane, went back to L.A. that night, he and I met, and we went through the whole season, our training regimen. And the thing that we came down to was that you know, our conditioning program needed to be adapted. We needed to change it. All right, give it to me quick. What you do? And don't well, think we, I'm just we, listening just for along, the television show. All summer long, we worked in our conditioning with the track. We did Olympic lifts. We went out there on the basketball court. And we did that, those three things, in one day. Mm -hmm. And we did that all summer long. We broke them up in cycles. Mm -hmm. Uh, because at the end of the game, even though the shots felt good, the truth of the matter is, my legs were tired. Mm. I wasn't ready. Mm. You know, so what am I going to have to do now to get ready so next time I'm in that position, I'm going to make those shots. Is that what you still do to this day? Oh, absolutely. I'm always asking why, you know, why didn't this work out? Okay, why did this work out? Mm -hmm. you know, how can I make this better? How can I make that better? So I'm always asking those questions to improve. Well, you asking that question when you won the championship, 2000, 2001, 2002, you're three-peat. What questions were you asking yourself during that time? How can we win another one? Because mm. every year, every time you win a championship, the next time you come back, it's always hard. People are always gunning for you. And I knew how they were going to play Shaquille. Mm -hmm. We knew that. How were they going to play Shaquille? Well, they always crowded him. Mm -hmm. They always crowded him. And they always try to take him out the game by physically beating him up or putting him at the line in critical situations. Mm -hmm. So 
as his, as his sidekick, I had to sit back and say, what am I going to do to bring to the table to help us win the championships? I knew what his weaknesses were. So now I have to make those my strengths. Mm. So that's how the combination was able to work. Well, what do you think you were bringing to the table? I mean, when we see you, we see Shaquille O'Neal, 7'1", 350 pounds, dominant figure. We see Kobe as everything else. What were we missing? What were the elements that were missing that, from Kobe Bryant in terms of what we saw from you on the court? What were we missing that was inside well, I, of you? I, I did a lot of, a lot of subtle things that Tex Winter and Phil Jackson taught me how to do as far as facilitate the offense. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I was a quarterback. And in a lot of ways, that's the same role that Lamar has with this team now. Is you have to quarterback the offense. You have to go through progressions. You have to read the defense. You have to know how they're playing Rick Fox on the wing. You have to know how they're playing Shaq. You have to know how, at the time, we had Glenn Rice. Mm -hmm. What are they going to do when Glenn Rice runs a rub, cup, rub, rub cut off Shaquille in the fourth quarter? Mm -hmm. and you got to read all of those angles. Mm -hmm. and, and that was my job. I had to study the game and make that happen. How did you like being a quarterback? I loved it. I lo it became a challenge. And the reason, why, the reason why it was fun for me is because you know, we can sit back, and I can sit back and watch film and, and get a kick out of the fact that you know, this team is you know, getting abused and they have no idea you know, how to stop it. Mm -hmm. But the fact that we're thinking about how to take, take advantage of them. Mm -hmm. you know, and I sat back and I enjoyed that. Quickly, where did the perception come that you didn't like being a quarterback, in your estimation? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I always enjoyed doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't be successful at something if you don't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we won three championships in five years. Mm -hmm. you know, if I didn't enjoy my, my role, how can you win a championship or be successful at doing what you're doing. It just doesn't work. Mm.